Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for hanging out. We're in our last speaker with a very interesting talk um, that will focus on giants. Um, so to survive gigantic, marine mammals need to consume densely concentrated food patches using satellite tracking of whale sharks and directional passive acoustic sensing of whales. This talk will explore how ocean giants move through vast and patchy ecosystems to forage. Um, so today our speaker will be John Ryan from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Um, and he's a biological oceanographer studying the ecology of plankton, fish, and mammals. So with that, John, I'll leave it up to you. Testing, testing, has it come through? Great, avoid that. Okay, yeah, well, about that introduction. <laughs> I was planning originally to focus on not just whales, but also whale sharks. And that's where you know outer space comes in. We're tracking the whale sharks from outer space. Um, however, I realize there's not really enough time. So I'm going to wait for Whale Shark Fest to do that one. And for here, I'm just going to focus on whales. And I'm glad to talk with people about the whale shark study as well, though. It's also um, beautiful. So, my name is on this presentation, it's true, but you know, this work can only happen with a tremendous group of collaborators who specialize in different areas. And you'll see that as I go along. So I want to first appreciate the wonderful collaborative environment that is here in the Monterey Bay region for these types of studies. And starting with uh, Jeremy Goldbogen's lab at Stanford Hopkins, who provided this photo of a blue whale here in the Monterey Bay region. And I am going to focus a fair amount on blue whales because this species has given us the best opportunities to integrate different types of technologies that we need to understand behavior at the individual level and the collective or population level. All right, how'd you do it, Fred? <laughs> Bottom one. Hey, all right, okay. So I wanted to start with um, blue whale populations before we get into watching individuals move in this region. Um, the bars on this chart, from a, this is from a, a technical report, Fisheries Canada, Christensen et al. And the bars, of course, are, you know, whales hunted, harvested. And since, you know, early 1900s up to um, near 2000, nearly, nearly a century of records here, including the, um, the <coughs> estimated population size and error bars on that. But you know, the main point for the North Pacific here is the fairly steep decline due to whaling and indications of recovery, with the population being nearly half of its original size here in the North Pacific. Um, other places not faring so well in this estimate, you know, North Atlantic, five, maybe 5%. Five and Southern, Southern Hemisphere? Well, the, um, the, um, the catch, the yeah, number of individuals is, oh, sorry, I should have explained that. The catch is represented on the right. The bars is the right axis, and then the number of individuals. Thank you for clarifying that. So, you know, they, they certainly need um, protection. And we really can't protect them if we don't understand how and where they live and how their activities intersect with our activities that can be harmful. Uh, Is that what that was saying? Yeah, this, uh, I'm saying this estimate here, published by Fisheries Canada, it shows that it was the most severely decimated population on the planet, and that when you decimate a population to such low levels, it takes a long time to recover. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's a model. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what the number is, but the very low. Very low. 
And, you know, I also want to highlight this really wonderful collaborative project involving World Wildlife Fund, UC Santa Cruz, Oregon State University, and University of Southampton, protecting blue corridors. Um, and this, this uh, really brought together information on the whale superhighways of, of the planet uh, for many species, again, helping us understand how they live so we can better protect them. And uh, we'll be focusing on blue whales in, in the Northeast Pacific. Um, this report also identifies some of the major threats faced by these populations. Climate change affecting their habitat and forage availability, fisheries that can cause them to be in, entangled or deplete the resources the whales need. Um, vessel strikes and um, chemical plastic and noise pollution and then uh, of course various forms of exploration and even hunting. These are all threats and the, the populations face multiple threats simultaneously. I'm going to focus on ship and vessel strikes using a a technology that's deployed right now just outside the bay at the end of a 32 mile cable that connects to Moss Landing. It's called the Monterey Accelerated Research System or Mars Cabled Observatory. It's a connection to the deep sea that gives you unlimited power and communication so we can stream audio data from the deep sea and continuously monitor the um, vocal activity by the whales. And this particular study is going to get into shipping and vessel strikes because it tells us how the whales uh, intersect with shipping lanes. And it does that by, because the hydrophone is more than just sensing the pressure, the same thing that you're receiving through these speakers now. It measures particle motion in three axes. So you can say not just, oh, I heard a blue whale, but it came from over there. And you can see them. You can watch them move as they mobilize. All right, my favorite audience members are here now. <laughs> I can proceed. So, and of course, whale strikes, we saw a dramatic picture earlier, but basically the, the animals, besides being struck by a mass moving very fast, they get trapped at the bow and drown. Um, uh, other injuries, can occur, um, you know, propeller arm. And so this is a wonderful video from Elliot Hazen. I want to use to make a, a point here as this giant comes up for a breath. As it goes down. It doesn't take long, it doesn't have, the animal doesn't have to be far below the surface to where we can't see it. And visual methods are phenomenal and have taught us so much and are essential forever. And yet when they're underwater, we can sense them through sound. We can continue to sense them even though the, the availability of information from light disappears as they go deeper. Their sounds can travel so far and so effectively that um, just by listening, we can tune into their lives. So let's tune into their lives. <laughs> um, this is one note from a blue whale song. Oh, you know what? Is it? That's not it. <laughs> that much I can tell you. So I wonder, did we, did we go, um, did we unplug from the, is it going first into the subwoofer? Okay. Same as yesterday, okay. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's not it. So, how can we, I guess, you're, all, you're up on that board. What about the P3? 
PC that's playing it? How's the volume on that? Hmm. Okay. I'm going to go back one more time and try it one more time. Yeah. So it's, I'm sorry, you should be, you should all be receiving a Blue Whale Sonic Massage right now because it's, <laughs> but we, 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 yeah, yeah. You would, but you need that speaker. <laughs> you need that 200 pound subwoofer to move a lot of air so that you feel it more than you hear it. So I guess we can come back to that um, after we, we'll go ahead, focus on the science for now, but we will cycle back so that you can leave here floating on blue whale vibes. This is important. So, so what, what we're hearing is what's different than what you anticipated. Yeah, yesterday we tested and it was, it was working great. It's um, volumes plenty up. We'll f we're going to let this... Is this lower? Um, it's your entire body would be vibrating. <laughs> That's what you would be really feeling it. So that, we're going to make that happen. But for now, for now, we're going we're gonna to stay on uh, in the left half of the brain. Um, and so that sound that you didn't hear. <laughs> No, it, it's like a low frequency rumble, comes in two parts, and that's, here's one of them here. It's a slight down sweep. So this is a spectrogram with frequency on the vertical, time on the horizontal. You're looking at about 33 minutes and just the lower uh, 90 hertz or so. Lower limit of human hearing is here. And you can see blue whales putting out a good bit of sound energy below our lower limit of hearing, even down around 11 hertz here with their C calls. So it's a C, B, and these are A calls. So this energy here is a B call, second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, okay. Then these are A calls, but it's this B call. You see how much brighter that third harmonic is than any other sound in the bass section? We key in on that because there's so much signal there. We can lock on to that long, low frequency tonal call. And with this acoustic vector sensor, track the movement of the whales. So that's the, um, the message. We'll give you the experience eventually. <laughs> List, listening, where are we listening? Well, um, you know, you are here. Moss Landing is here. This is where the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute is located. My office is right there. And then the cable cuts across rides on the surface of the seafloor across the northern shelf south of Santa Cruz. There's Soquel Canyon. And then at the edge of the continental shelf, the topography drops off a little more steeply here to um, a feature called Smooth Ridge. And that's where the Monterey Accelerated Research System, or MARS, is located. The cable comes <coughs> right there. Um, and we plug in our science instruments uh, to those ports I'll show you in a moment. And as we zoom out from the listening location, you can kind of see it's a natural geological amphitheater. You know, just open to, open to listening, open to the greater Pacific and to the many species that live in this region and produce sound. We can tap into their lives. And we deployed that system on, from the research festival, <laughs> Rachel Carson, remotely operated vehicle Ventana. This is the extension cord that we're gonna uh, <laughs> back away with. And here's a tripod, see the tripod, and the hydrophone is right there. It's not a big instrument, but this little instrument produces big data, about two terabytes per month. <laughs> because we're recording at a very high sample rate, which allows us to hear everything from the lowest frequency rumbles of the earth. <laughs>
I would jump ahead a little bit, like, because this is like a two-minute video. And it's, if you've never watched a remote operated vehicle work, it's kind of exciting. <laughs> And there's our extension cord because we want to move the recorder a little bit away from the main node, which does produce some noise. We, we don't want to be listening right next to that, so we unspool. tripod and so far so good sometimes we have animals crawling on the hydrophone <laughs> but nothing big yet that has knocked it over and so this is Paul Leary at the Naval Postgraduate School he was going to be here for this talk but he couldn't make it today so this is just a moment of honoring Paul because Paul really enabled this together with Kevin <laughs> plug this they own this acoustic vector sensor that goes beyond hearing to pointing. And here's a dual acoustic vector system, one, two units, um, that we just deployed in last November. So the point here is that for three years we had a single acoustic vector sensor, which just means we can say it came from over there. But we don't know how far away. We can't put it on the map yet. But if you have two bearings to the call, you can get a range and put the animal on the map. So that's just starting. And Vanessa Zobel is a Dr. Nancy Foster scholar with NOAA. She came out with us for this deployment and did a, a brief internship with us at Ambari as well, and is doing some phenomenal work her, herself in her PhD work. And I guess that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I guess we should have tested this morning. <laughs> That's my bad. I should have realized that the background ship noise on that video would be loud through a subwoofer. So we're going to skip that. What you would see is the, it was an elevator basically with all that equipment. It's dropped to the seafloor. Then you send the remotely operated vehicle after it and you tend to all the parts and deploy them on the seafloor. So now we're going to go on to, I, ca I called it strategies, you know, foraging strategies of oceanic giants. So let's, yes, that's a human concept we're going to apply to whales. But in fact, they need strategies. They need to be able to find extremely dense patches of krill, which is all they eat. But finding those patches in a vast ocean is, it's not so easy. So let's think about the first strategy itself, which is um, observing individuals find them. And the question is, um, you know, really it's about communication. You know, what, what Fred was talking about. How do they communicate with each other? That's what we're going to look at. And the, this is a recent study published in the fall. And I wanted to show this because all these people here made it possible. People with many specializations. Paul and Kevin with that directional hydrophone. Kelly uh, Bonnet Bird, I'll show you her work in a moment. She um, does active acoustic sensing of the forage species so we know what the whales have to eat. Uh, Will A. Strike is a postdoc with us now. Um, we've got Dave Cade, who is a student at Hopkins as well. And James and, uh, and Jeremy Goldbogen's lab tagging whales so we can observe the world from the perspective of the whale. John Kalamakitis at Cascadia. Anyway, Andrew de Vogler at the sanctuary. 
And, and lastly, I want to emphasize observations are critical, but we also need theory. And what John Joseph and Tatjana Margolina at the Naval Postgraduate School did was to model how blue whale sound moves through the ocean. Because we need to know how far away can we hear these animals, for example. So it is really always an integration of observation and theory to help us really get a more complete picture. And I'll show you those, those results as well. So um, when we're studying blue whales, we are actually, we're studying biological oceanography, which is very interdisciplinary. We can't understand blue whales without understanding everything from how the winds off this coast drive ocean circulation that brings deep, cold, nutrient-rich water to the surface, and enables the microscopic algae to do that magical transformation of non-living matter into living matter that feeds the whole ocean. And so this is a NASA image of land and sea with the ocean color accentuated. So you can see these filaments and eddies of uh, chlorophyll-enriched water where the ecosystem has been fertilized and the plants are growing, which allows the microscopic animals to grow and so on through the food web. And blue whales are only two steps away from the magical <laughs> life forms that use light to power that transformation and create life, the phytoplankton. So zooplankton eat phytoplankton, krill eat zooplankton and phytoplankton, and whales eat krill. They're very close to that transformation of sunlight. And that's efficient. They need efficiency. That is, the more steps you take in the trophic linkages, the more energy you lose. So they're, the giants are very close to the small. And the key process we're going to focus on is wind-driven upwelling. When the winds are out of the northwest, in this region we have cold upwelling plumes developing at Point Ana Nuevo and Point Sur and along the Sur coast here. And what you're seeing is as the winds intensify, the cold water plumes expand, get colder, <laughs> and so on, until the winds relax and the ocean begins to warm again. And what we hypothesized is that blue whales would know very well how to find these cold plumes. And the reason we hypothesized that is this earlier work led by Kelly Murray Bird at Ambari, where we found that when the winds are strong and causing that upwelling, krill, this is krill on the lower uh, and anchovies on the upper, when you go from relaxation of winds to upwelling winds, what you notice is the scattered fish and krill form very dense, tight clusters. These red splotches are much higher densities of food, and that is what the blue whales need to find. And so let's see, there's, there's no sound on this one. <laughs> That's a krill swarm at the edge of the continental shelf, right at the shelf break where blue whales tend to forage. I mean, I think I could swim around there with my mouth open and get a few. But a blue whale takes in a mass of water that weighs more than their own body in one gulp, filters it out, leaving only the krill. And they might, they'll, um, during a single foraging dive, they may do five of these engulfment feeding events. So they're taking in a huge amount of energy as, as they need to. So now let's track um, upwelling and whales. We're looking at uh, a call index of blue whales over a period of uh, one, two, three, four, five years, <laughs> six song seasons. And what you notice is the whales sing, they have an annual cycle when they're here and singing. They're here in the summer foraging, but they're not singing. They start singing more in the fall. And it's that song signal that we're gonna, gonna capture. Now the first thing we had to do was convince ourselves that this acoustic vector sensor could point to a blue whale. So we did that with, again, Jeremy Goldbogen's lab had a blue whale tag out on an animal that was right here and that animal was singing. We recorded the song. We knew right where it was, GPS. So that's where outer space comes in in this story. <laughs> GPS tracking of the animal. We knew where it was, and then we asked, okay, did our sensor on the observatory receive that song? And if so, can we point to the whale? And what you're looking at in this green cone 
is how that sensor pointed to where it thought the whale, singing whale was located. So, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to trust this sensor. And un I mentioned earlier how important it is to get the theory. Well, see this black contour here? That's how far away we can hear a blue whale with sufficient signal intensity that we know we can point to it. So that's our listening domain. And what you'll notice is if we wanted to study a relationship between blue whales and these coastal upwelling plumes, we really can't do that for the points that are up on the plume always because it flows out of our listening domain. Can't track the whale so well that far away. But this up on plume at Point Año Nuevo flows right into our listening domain, so we focus on that one. And first thing to notice is that if you look at two years of data, um, here we've got the observing, the where the sound is received, and the bearings from here to Point Año Nuevo and Point Sur are these dashed lines, which are repeated here. And you'll notice the clustering of calls singing around those coastal upwelling centers. So if you look at through time, they tend to um, inhabit this, these areas around coastal upwelling centers. Now what about when the winds spin up and things change? Um, the wind measurements here um, are showing you one major upwelling event, followed by a second one that happened in a few pulses. So let's focus on this first one. When the winds, upwelling favorable winds, kicked in, these, see these lines coming to the surface? What that means is at this location right here, there's a mooring, and these cold, dense waters flow down and, and hit the mooring. When you see them come up to the surface, you've got cold, dense water at the surface. That's the upwelling boom right there. So what we see is when upwelling kicks in, the ocean responds, the whales respond. These black dots is the, are the percentage of whales calling from within the bay. So you can see them respond very quickly. Now before they were in the bay, they were in this uh, red area, offshore and transected by four shipping lanes which is where their primary threat is. So, okay, the upwelling goes away, then it kicks in again. And we see the cold waters come to the surface. It's intermittent upwelling with intermittent signals, and the whales move into the bay. So that was the first key thing we learned. They are so attuned to their environment that when the winds change the ocean circulation, they can track the features where their, their prey are located. And when it's not upwelling, they're in an area that is, is a major threat. So you heard Lisa's talk earlier this morning about voluntary ship speed reductions in the sanctuary that are planned. That's the most helpful thing we can do right now is slow down ships, which not only reduces the risk to whales, but also reduces carbon and noise pollution and makes it more efficient, uh, cost efficient for the shipping companies. So blue whale strategy number two, how am I doing on time? Am I close? Okay, blue whale strategy number two, I wanna highlight this work led by Dave Cade when he was a graduate student at Stanford. He's now a, a postdoc. And Dave did a beautiful job just bringing together the mosaic, complex mosaic of a blue whale's life. I just still amazed by this work. Um, so what you're looking at here is uh, a map and an aerial view of whales moving toward a certain point on the map. <laughs> so when Dave was doing his research, he came across these exceptionally dense aggregations of blue whales. Like picture about 40 blue whales within a one kilometer radius. Yeah, that, and another event, 25. It's a lot of blue whales. So why were those blue whales coming to that location to uh, aggregate and feed. They were clearly foraging. Well, let's notice a few things about those two locations. On this map, it's the red triangles. Translated here, um, the Bay Crescent is here. Here's Monterey Submarine Canyon. Look at these small finger canyons. They're right at the heads of these small finger canyons, right at the shelf break. And this is an aerial photo of multiple blue whales streaming 
heading over to this hotspot, this supergroup, as it was called. And Dave found with active acoustic sensing that the forging conditions at the hotspot were phenomenal, just exactly what a blue whale would want. Thick, dense, evenly distributed layers of krill so that every time they dive through it, come back up and open their massive mouth and expand their pleated underside to take in that mass of water, they'll get a lot of energy. <laughs> so, and further those, it, it was, he compared near and outside the foraging area so that it was clear that the, they, the, the whales found the best spot. And then, um, oh, I think I'm not going to, well, I'll give it a try. Let's give it a try. This is um, a D call, which is associated with foraging. The last call, that tonal is song. This is males and females produce this song uh, when they're foraging. Let's see if it goes. Hmm. You know what? It could be that I transferred it to a different computer before this, for this. So I'm going to try and plug in my computer at the end, and you all are going to get blown away by blue whales. So, <laughs> so let's move on. Can you forward that? I can't get it past that. Huh, OK. I'll do that, yeah, at the end. We'll do the sounds later. Thank you, Mike. Um, so here's what Will A. Strike found working with our recordings on the Cable Observatory. Here are these D calls that you'll hear in a, in a while. They're a beautiful down sweep that ends with sonic massage. They've got, um, Will figured out the average daily cycle. And then he, he figured out when, when are these, when are we hearing an unusually high level of these D calls, which indicate active foraging. And what he found is that here are those two supergroup uh, aggregations and right before each supergroup there were these these black bars indicate anomalously high levels of decals. So the interpretation from this study is that blue whales can, number one, they can signal each other over very long distances. We could see animals streaming to a foraging site they can hear each other from so far away that if an individual finds a good place to forage and that forage availability is so great, one individual could never exhaust it, a hundred individuals could, couldn't exhaust it, but it's only there for a short time before the ocean changes, then it, it would be to your advantage as a blue whale to let others know when you have found exceptional foraging conditions, everyone benefits and then the next time you need to forage or you find a patch, you share that information or gain it from someone else, you have a regional population then that is collectively sensing a vast volume and finding exactly what's needed for everybody and sharing information as an acoustic signpost. So that's the second strategy, you know, find them, share information. And then the third strategy I'll highlight is, is Will's dissertation. <laughs> adapt to what a year offers. And so um, when we, I, I know you've seen this before, but there's a, a, a new dimension here. There's this seasonal cycle to when the blue whales are here. It rises in the fall because the behavior rises in the population that's already living here. It goes away in the winter, not because they stop singing, they're still down south singing their hearts out. <laughs> But we don't hear them anymore. They're too far away. So that's why it looks like that. Um, they actually are singing much more of the year. And so then what you're looking at here is the night to day ratio. How much song is happening night versus day? So as the, this middle bar here, the median, rises above one, they're singing a lot more at night. And as it drops off and eventually drops below one, which means they start singing more during the day. We had no idea why this existed, but it's that individual level behavior that allowed us to explore this. So here are the brave souls, <laughs> uh, like the wet team, <laughs> the uh, whale entanglement team. 
you know, getting close to these giants to learn about them so we can protect them. And this is actually Dave Cade putting, with a carbon fiber pole, slapping a suction cup attached tag on the back of the animal. And it'll stay on for about a day. And it'll give you a window into their world. And so here's what a tag deployment looks like. The black line is the track in depth. The animal dives down, comes back to the surface to breathe throughout this time period. And everywhere you see a blue dot, that's a foraging lunge. They're spending a lot of energy opening their mouth, filtering out uh, krill. Then we get toward dusk, and you start to see song calls showing up. Only foraging during the day, oops, starting to sing a bit at night, but hey, found some good food, might as well chow down. Oh, then just singing into the night. So that's why in the fall, when they're really focused on foraging, we would hear more song at night. That's what they're doing it. Now, what, what happens when you look at 664 hours of observation from those tags, you, you see this bear out with the song call rate here mostly happening at night and dusk dawn. In contrast, foraging is mostly happening during the day, the white bars. So they are, they're kind of partitioning the day. That's why we hear it that way from the whole population. And now uh, this phenomenal perspective from one of the Cascadia tags where an individual foraging um, you know, north of San Francisco Bay here for a while, you see here's a month and during the first week, no, 10 days, this animal is pretty much staying at the same latitude. And then it heads south and with time you see drop in latitude. And there's a lot of data here, so let's just walk through it. The circles represent the number of song calls per day. And if it's red, it means they're mostly singing um, at, oh, I'm, yeah, sorry, I got it backwards. Feeding lunges are, are in circles. Um, they're mostly foraging during the day. That's what red means. And in blue, that's the song calls. So here's that uh, partitioning, feeding during the day, singing at night. Then the animal starts heading south and there's no more feeding. It stops feeding and it starts singing and you notice the triangles go from blue to red. It's starting to sing more during the day. So that tells us from the individual perspective that what we are hearing when we look at this, tre this pattern in, in the population is uh, a transition from foraging to migration that happens every year. And so what Will went on to find is that the timing of this transition is so closely attuned to how well the ecosystem is feeding the whales. Here, that's shown here by the date of the behavioral transition from foraging to migration earlier in the year, later in the year, and the peak of biologically effective upwelling. Know anything about that, Mike? <laughs> Mike has developed an index we rely on a lot for understanding upwelling and how it shapes the ecosystem. And what you can see is this positive relationship. If the ecosystem is highly productive, the whales leave later. They stay longer because they need to pack on those energy stores for long distance migration, birthing, rearing of young, and returning all the way back here. So if the ecosystem is feeding them, they'll stay longer. And so that's just another example of how closely attuned these giants are to what the ecosystem is doing. Not just on the time scale of wind-driven upwelling event, but on seasonal time scales and year-to-year -year changes in the ecosystem. So I think I'm going to switch over to my laptop and we're, we're going to do this sonic massage. <laughs> Here's this one. Oh, they, they don't need to see this, so we'll just, okay. 
Here is a blue whale bee call. And That's one note from a blue whale song. It's a two-part B call. And it would be really great if we could experience that in water. But we'll do what we can with air. We'll move some air. <laughs> so that's a B call in song. That's what we use to track the movements of the whales. Now let's go to the foraging call, which is just as good. All right. There it is. The last, am I out of time, Jasmine? Okay, because I was just gonna go on to one more thing and, and in the base section with the blue whales or the fin whales, they put out something that's much more percussive, of um, an impulsive sound, pulse trains, and they look like that. And I'm gonna play this back at twice normal speed because if I play it back at real time, it's so low frequency that even this subwoofer really can't do it justice. So this is going to be pitched up a little bit from reality. And um, fin this is fin whale song, so this would be males singing. And we hear them singing about 10 months out of the year. Yeah. Okay, so here is, this one's a little, I want to warn you, this one's a little bit startling. And that's one simple that the fin whale is staying with a single frequency, peak frequency in the pulse, and it's very rhythmic, very regular. This next one is a doublet where they very, yes. The, the real peak frequency of a fin whale pulse is somewhere between 17 and 20 hertz, so right at and below the lower limit of our hearing. Yeah, and so here's a, another one. This is played back at four times normal speed, so it'll be pitched up even more. Um, but this is a doublet where they vary the pitch a little bit between them. So, creativity of a fin whale here. Yeah. Doublet. Fin whales use low frequency calls that travel oh, hundreds of miles. These calls are hard for us to hear, so we sped them up. <laughs> so I'll finish up at the front, thank you very much, with just the, uh, yeah, sure. And you can go to the, in Santa Cruz at the NOAA Sanctuary Exploration Center across from the wharf, we have a resident exi sound exhibit with a subwoofer so you can experience not just the low frequency sounds of life, which are beautiful and inspiring, but also a reality, um, experience of reality for them, which is low frequency noise from shipping, which they have to deal with. Um, so you heard that, you heard that. And so what I, the last data, bit of data I have for you today is that Blue and fin whales, they're shaped really similarly. We think they mostly just eat krill in this region. Well, we know blue whales do. And so the question is, how do they partition this habitat at all? Well, right away, if you look in time and you look at an average year, blue whales in blue, fin whales in orange, you can see that blue whales start singing earlier 
and fin whales remain here singing longer. So there's this sense of a temporal offset in the two species. And using three years of that acoustic vector sensor data, we can see that there's a spatial offset as well. That's easiest to see when you just look at these line plots. So let's start with the first year of our listening. Um, east, south, west, and north are relative to the listening location. And you can see fin whales tend to really stay in this band. And this band is all offshore. Here's west, you know, definitely offshore. But you can see most of the fin whale song is west. Uh, the blue whales tend to peak at the upwelling centers here and here, as we saw in that other study. Two upwelling centers, those are where the peaks are. So there's this sense that spatially also they are using different habitat, at least the singing animals are. Uh, but so what we're doing is uh, looking at sighting data through that lens. How often do we see them foraging together, um, blue and fin whales? And if fin whales really are just persistently further offshore, even inhabiting the area over Davidson Seamount that Lisa introduced this morning, that additional part of the sanctuary, um, how are they making a living? Because the blue whales are usually finding the krill swarms right at the continental shelf break, but if you go offshore, you don't have that geological feature and all of the richness that it brings to foraging blue whales. So they must be finding shallower krill swarms or uh, smaller krill swarms. We don't really know. So there's some good opportunities to understand how these two endangered species uh, live and how they both make a good uh, mm. this one I think is going to work as long as this speaker's on I'm going to turn this one subwoofers down 30 dB so you will not get that startling effect sorry again <laughs> but connection this is about connection Alexa Ask Ocean Soundscape to play Humpback Whale. Here is a 6 minute 43 seconds recording of a single humpback whale song. They can repeat their songs for many hours. daughters and we were developing an Alexa skill for this live stream and for uh, pre-recorded clips of different species and so he just took that opportunistically to show how sound sound connects our lives profoundly and sound from the ocean gives us a window not only into ecology that can inform conservation but it helps us connect to another life form whose lives are so much different than our own you know we we hear life so Anyway, that's what was that that they asked you here? Humpback whale. So you can enable the skill on your Alexa device, mm -hmm. and then you just say, Alexa, ask Ocean Soundscape to play humpback whales or dolphins or sperm whales, and, or the live stream, which is not super exciting this time of year because the whales have moved on, but uh, you never know what you'll hear. It's good white noise for going to sleep anyway. Mm -hmm. So. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, John. And I think it was almost better that it was at the end, because now we're going to be very motivated at that sonic <laughs> massage. So thank you. And uh, before we all leave, I just want to give a very special Shout out to all of the team members that really helped put together an event like this. And of course, it takes a whole village um, here in Monterey Bay. We want to thank the Fisherman's Wharf, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, the California State Parks Historic Monterey Park, Marine Life Studies, Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, the Arte Council, and the Glastonbury... I've, uh,
a technology team who has been really key in getting all of this together. And a very, very special thanks to uh, Mary Alice Fetis, who is the chair of the Well Festival, and Antoinette Saylor, who's the director of the Well Festival. So thank you very much for coming, and we'll see you here tomorrow.